Welcome to Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Well, as much as it drives Fuzzy Butts all over this place, absolutely crazy when they hear me say it. I am the host of this show, your big dog, Luke Robinson. Back with you again this week, and also back again with us this week is Ginger Morgan. She's our co-producer and also our co-host, and she's additionally the executive director of the Puppy Up Foundation. Ginger, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm really interested in hearing more about this episode and the um, subject that we're going to do, because... Uh, you know, I always try to get in something about Pete right there. So he had the um, vet stem procedure in 08, early That's on. Right. That's right. There's there there is a connection <laughs> for, for you with Pete. There's also connection for me as well. As you know, Indiana Jones, my fuzzy butt four, just turned uh, 12 yesterday. And unfortunately, he's suffering from the entropy we all succumb to ultimately. <laughs> and uh he, he's his high mobility is is really uh, gotten uh, worrisome and concerning. And as you know, we talked, we took him in to see one of our guests here, Dr. Angie Zinkas, to uh, get a DM <laughs> and stuff. And so we're looking at treatment alternatives. And one of those alternatives, one of those potential treatment modalities, is stem cells. So this is a first episode for us. I'm excited to introduce our guest today. First with us is Dr. Angie Zinka. She's a veterinarian here in Memphis, uh, Tennessee. Uh, Angie, how are you? Welcome to Fuzzy Butts. Thank you for having me. I just couldn't be happier to be here because uh, stem cell is something I love to talk about. <laughs> I've actually been doing it since 2008, so now I've really dated myself. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and and, and the, you know, we were talking before, and this is why I love stem cell right now, because we were talking about degenerative myelopathy, and I had no clue that you could stem cells could be treated. So I'm so glad Dr. Harmon's here um, because okay. that stem is an organization. I can call them and be like, hey, can I treat this? And they have something new to tell me in a protocol. And I just am so thankful for this organization because they have helped me in all my years, um, blood, sweat, and tears. And uh, it's a learning process. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested to hear, I'll probably learn some stuff from Dr. Harmon myself today. <laughs> well, you, you just did the intro right there. For, um, well, it's a good thing that we actually have what I would say is a, an expert in the area of, of stem cells and veterinary medicine. It's Dr. Robert Harmon. He's the CEO of Vet Stem. He's been doing this for a long time. Dr. Harmon, welcome to Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Thank you so much. You guys do such incredible work. It, it is really exciting. And in this world, you know, I, I'm I'm the oldest one on the deal. You know, before we had podcasts and before we had ability to reach out to the community, dog community, it was really hard to get the word out about things that were new and exciting. And, you know, I started in veterinary medicine in the 80s. And, and we didn't have all this. I was one of the first ones doing computers and doing, you know, not podcasts, but being able to get on conference calls and educate veterinarians. So instead, I would go to the meetings, stand up on the podium, bang on the deal and say, you guys need to look at these new technologies. It makes a difference to our to our little critters. It's huge. You know, it's hugely now uh, expanded to be able to have the reach. So what you do is great. I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Thank you very much. Thank well, you. technology is transforming veterinary, veterinary medicine, that's for sure. And and so is stem cells. So, but before we get into the, the business side of things, this is Fuzzy Butts and Friends, and we like to keep it fun and friendly. So we like to start our show by talking about Fuzzy Butts. Now, Angie, I got to meet your Fuzzy Butt, I think a couple of weeks ago here in Memphis. Yogi, do you have him with you? He's a handsome fella. There is you. Hi, <laughs> Yogi. Know, look at that. Bella. He's so cute. I woke him up from his nap. So he I just, it. <laughs> he yeah, does he not look, look happy about that. Well, I was going to say, Ginger, he does not look amused. <laughs> No, he does not. Bob, who do you have there with you? <laughs> this is Mick, a year old border collie. I, as you know, they're like wild critters, and I've had them for for forty years. He's actually a hearing service dog in training. Uh -huh. um, I lost my last one to the topic right to cancer. He was a red border collie, uh, been, and I had him for ten years. He was named after my mentor veterinarian, uh, and he was my hearing service dog. I've got a high end hearing loss, and I backpack a lot. And so in California, we have rattlesnakes everywhere. And he was actually trained to detect rattlesnake and come back and sit like a bomb dog in my feet and, and tell me not to go forward. So oh, mix wow. in training for that. And he's, he's wow. a, a, another crazy border collie. Um, 
and and all of my critters, all all nine of them that I've had over the years, have all been treated with stem cells at different times for exactly what Luke was saying. They all get older, right? Happens, mm -hmm. and and we get older, they get older, and and if you don't know, uh, we can get into it. I'm actually a patient as well. I had my shoulder treated. We can chat about how translational medicine works, which is what your you know entire puppy foundation is about. Right. Translational <laughs> medicine between human and vet. We're all kind of the same. We we are mechanically, and I think maybe spiritually as well. I'm so sorry to hear, Bob, your loss yeah. Uh, yeah. Of, of your dog to cancer. Yeah. What was his or her name? Ben. Yeah. yeah. He was a spectacular dog, and he had a really rare, and you may not even seem one, he had a rare heart tumor. Border collies, like, there's, like, not even reported that they get it, and and it was uh, my first experience with that, with uh, with that particular kind of tumor, and, and uh, you know, we have limited options in, in the veterinary world for treating those kinds of things, and, and uh, you know, stem cells was part of his growth. He had, he had some orthopedic problems, treated him. He had a... Uh, a problem with his bladder, a bad infection when he was a year old. Again, really, really rare in yeah. in border collies. And he had the rarest kind of stone in there. And after we had surgery, cleaned it out, treated him with stem cells, never came back. So wow. we use them in some really interesting and odd ways, as well as the standard things like orthopedics that most people know it for. Well, I'm excited to hear about all the different indications yeah. of, uh, of usage. And you're right, is that in a sense, we're all... Entropy affects all of us. It doesn't matter what our species is, uh, what our breed is. It gets yeah. to us all. And we yeah. all want to kind of slow down that process so that yeah. we can have a longer quality of life, I think. And that's certainly a cross-species uh, uh, hope and aspiration. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we get into the, the meat of the discussion, though, I'd like to talk about uh, your respective origin stories. So, Angie, <laughs> let's start with you since you made the connection. Thank goodness uh, for us with Bob here and VetStem. So Angie, how did you get involved in veterinary, veterinary medicine? It seems like you probably were always an animal lover. Tell us your history. I, okay, so I actually, in uh, I thought I was going to be a pediatrician or an OBGYN. Wow. Um, <laughs> yep, three months, and this was back in 1999. I was getting ready to graduate from Rhodes College, and three months before I graduated, I said, I don't want to do that. And so my mom said, what about being a veterinarian? And I said, is that even a doctor? So, <laughs> so, the, uh, so I, we were driving down Germantown Parkway and I stopped at the emer at pet med emergency. It was pet med. It's MVS now. And they wouldn't hire me as a technician because I couldn't have put an IV catheter in. May I say now they're asking me to come work ER shifts for them. <laughs> uh, so, um, but um, so I came down to Germantown Parkway Animal Hospital in 1999, 22 years old. And they hired me at eight bucks an hour. And um, they, I got peed on, pooped on, vomited on, <laughs> bitten, scratched, and I wanted to do it more than ever. Um, my father always said, find a job where you never have to work a day in your life. And that's, no two seconds are the same. I love what I do. It took me three years to get into vet school. I got out at 26. Um, I, or excuse me, at 30, I went in at 26, I got out at 30. I came here back to Germantown Parkway in 2007 as a veterinarian, became the medical director in 2016. And um, I now I'm the medical director over at in Arkansas at the emergency center. I currently am on the state board. So my journey has been, it, it has been a lot of work, um, but I'm proud of what I've done. Um, and like I said, and I became interested in stem cell in 2008 and my the owners at this place at the time loved the guys. They're wonderful, but they kind of laughed at me right, and right. they laughed of at course. me. And, yeah, of and, course. <laughs> and, and I said, well, I'm going to do it. And back then, you know, we didn't have digital x-ray. So when I was doing my first stem cell, <laughs> putting the needles in, I was putting them in the joints and we take an x-ray. That stem cell must have taken two hours to, to <laughs> inject the stem cell. Um, but I'm just, I, I love what I do and never stop learning. I mean, it's just, yeah. and, and, and this is the peak of my career being on a podcast with Dr. Harmon, the CEO of that. <laughs> so, so I, oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm, I'm, my feelings are hurt. I thought the peak of your career was volunteering at the Humane Society. Right? That, I forgot about that. Yeah, and yeah, that yeah. was probably 2007. That's when yeah. Ginger and I met yeah. and I would come over and learn how to do, and do spays and neuters to get faster. Um, yeah. I forgot. I'm so sorry. Yeah. She helped launch my career. Yeah. What am I saying? 
<laughs> it, it's okay. Ginger takes everything personally, so don't <laughs> worry about that. I was just, I was just teasing. <laughs> well, you certainly are a passionate advocate for uh, companion animals, Angie. I've, I met you just a few weeks ago for the first time. Ginger's known you for quite a while, and uh, that that came through uh, uh, right from the start. That you, you you love what you do. You're you're very passionate, and you're also passionate about caring for my Indiana Jones and making sure he gets the right treatment and. Uh, Hopefully we can continue his quality of life for years to come. So thank you for being here. So oh, Bob, Bob, uh, Dr. Harmon, let's go to you, sir. Uh, how did you get <laughs> to start in veterinary medicine? You said back in the 80s, you've been rocking and rolling for a while now. So how did you get your start? And more importantly, what was the inspiration behind uh, starting uh, Vet Stem, sir? Yeah, so I always wanted to be a horse doc. Go figure. Like you never know in veterinary medicine, you can be anything. It lets you go so many different directions. So you, you can see it all a horseback. I, I had a little part of my career where I played polo for a while, but I've ridden horses since I was a kid. And I went to Davis thinking I was going to be a horse doc. Same thing. Undergraduate took me four years to get into vet school. Took him a, a little while to figure out that I was going to be a useful student. Um, <laughs> but during my career, I worked in livestock facilities and I became really excited about the production of food globally, how important it is. And, and so I actually graduated as a cow doctor, but in vet school, and this led to everything I've done, the guy that I named my dog after, Ben, Dr. Ben Norman, um, asked me if I wanted to be a computer programmer. Like Angie, I, I'd never been a computer programmer. I also never put a catheter in an IV probably before either. <laughs> and he said, we need to teach veterinarians how to use computers for record systems. That's going to be the future. Instead of teaching programmers veterinary medicine, I want to I'll hire you. So I was a programmer during vet school, and I made programs to collect data. So when I got out of veterinary school, I actually formed, as well as a practice, a business to do computer records for dairymen and for veterinarians and to do analysis of data, which nobody had done before. And so you guys will remember, you know, in the 80s were in the 70s were the first microcomputers. So it was the first innovation we could use as a, as a professional to help make our professional life better. So I got known as the guy who could collect data, do data. That led to companies called and said, hey, we understand that you've got some databases. Could you, could you do clinical trials? I didn't actually know what clinical trials were. I'd read some some <laughs> articles on that. And so I said, okay, so we did clinical trials for the big vet companies, all ones you know, Angie, Elanco, back then mm -hmm. Pfizer, Upjohn, all the same companies that also had human divisions. And this will connect in a minute. And so I started doing these clinical trials. And then the human companies, biotech companies in California, called me and said, hey, we heard there's this crazy veterinarian and he knows how to do computers and clinical trials. We need to use you to help us get our preclinical for human trials done. So I was doing work on, I did the first human stent, literally the first oh, human wow. stent that J&J &J sells. I did the studies for the company that got that license and sold it to J&J. &J. So go figure, right, Angie, you follow these weird pathways as mm -hmm. veterinarians because you've got this broad learning. And, and so that built an entire set of companies for me that I sold in 2000. I started playing polo. I'm riding across the polo field and I get this phone call on my cell phone. It's the CEO of a stem cell company in San Diego. The first one here trying to get it involved in humans. And he said, Hey Bob, you're a vet, right? And I said, yeah. And I'm on a horse. And he said, there's this technology. You can get stem cells from fat tissue. And I go, what? No, no. Stem cells are in bone marrow. And, and, you know, so this, this, he said, you need to license this. This might be a business. And so this was my next business. So we founded VetStem 2002, that pure random. Now I'd seen lots of early cell therapy. We helped develop the first artificial skin for humans. And it's still on the market wow. today for burn wounds. And so I knew the power of the cell, but I didn't understand the power of the stem cell. And, and so I said, okay, we'll form the company. And then we started collecting data. It's 2002. And, and we started in horses because I knew that. And, and, you know, it was tendon ligament injuries because orthopedics made sense. Yeah, a lot of horses got put down because they, they couldn't fix them. And, you know, now here we are 20 years later, 25,000 patients treated in the U.S. and Canada by veterinarians like Angie. And were it not for forward-thinking veterinarians like her, 
we wouldn't have a business and we wouldn't have treated these patients. It's a little bit of a leap of faith at the beginning, right, Angie? You look at oh, it and yeah. go, <laughs> No, you're going to do a little liposuction or collect fat and you're going to give me a product that I can treat, you know, a serious disease. And so it was it was early. But now we've treated across 44 different species, 25,000 patients. And wow. in 2018, to finish the origin story, we decided I still got tired of waiting. I said, you know, I got myself treated. I, I don't know why this this doesn't make sense that we're not doing this in humans. We spun out a human stem cell company. And in nine months from the time we formed the company in 2018, we were treating knees in people using all the data from your dogs, your cats, your horses. And, yeah, and that, now that, we're in process to get that approved through FDA. That's such a fascinating origin story. <laughs> and it wants to speak to my heart because I'm a data guy. And, and you're right. The data is is the foundation of so many different everything, of, everything, of, of, of really of everything. Exactly. I think that's probably why AI will will ultimately be the end of mankind because it can process and you know. maybe, 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 maybe not. <laughs> but one one of the key things that that I think sets aside what we do from a lot of the craziness in the stem cell area. You know, I'm sure in in Nashville, in Memphis, you can drive down the road and there and there are billboards saying, "Come get your stem cells," by the crazy chiropractor who's not yeah. practicing in their in their lane and treating you know brain diseases and and you know it's not. Not that the stem cells might not have a role, but from the beginning, I published papers. I went to meetings. We've got 15 published papers and book chapters on this topic. You know, nobody in vet does that and nobody in the human stem cell. They're, they're, I mean, there's legitimate companies, but we've really tried to be data driven from the beginning, which is why Angie gets bugged by our people uh, to send data in on cases that she treats. It's really wow. important. It's how we get better. I have to admit, I, I I I know so very little about stem cell technology, and that's why I'm so excited for this episode. And I'm I'm fascinated to hear exactly how you can extract stem stem cells from fat cells because I always thought that that they were part of the progenitor cells and 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 undifferentiated. And I I had all these ideas and just didn't know a whole lot. But but to me, stem cells are similar to AI in that they're this black box. Right. that potentially do so much for regenerative medicine. And that's kind of where I want to start the discussion, uh, Bob, if you don't mind. Yeah. It, tell yeah. us about regenerative, med regenerative medicine. It's so powerful, important. Yeah. And as you were saying earlier, it applies to both pets and people, companion animals and, and our human yeah. counterparts. So so talk to us in broad strokes. Uh, how, how big is regenerative medicine? What's going on? And uh, what's the potential that we see with it? Let me first tell you what it is. And Angie's already taken our course. She's seen my lectures. She knows she'll know this this example. But let, let's say uh, you reach over to grab that piece of paper on the side of your desk over there and you you pull it across your finger and you get a paper cut. What happens? It bleeds, right? bleeds for a little bit then it stops we got these cool little things called platelets and they're in the blood and they block the bleeding so you don't just bleed out and then what happens so if you're if you're so i'll use you angie so i'm gonna pick on you if i was angie's age which i am not um it would heal pretty quickly and she wouldn't pay much attention to it she'd go with her and you look at it and and over a week it's gone Right. If it was a really deep cut, might be a little scar. If it, I don't know if you have kids, Angie, or or if you have kids, but if you have kids, kids heal like before your very eyes. They oh, have yeah. more stem cells, more regenerative capacity, and in utero before they're born, they can repair almost anything completely scarless. So. That's just what we're trying to do. We're trying to take that natural phenomena. We all can heal as we get older. You get what I call stem cell depletion a little bit. But what really was the, 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 the innovation that would change the world. Right now, if you checked my bone marrow, which is where we all thought stem cells come from, right, Angie, in vet school. Yep. All the stem cells, all the progenitors are in the bone marrow. That's how you make your blood. That's And, and you, if you look at my bone marrow and you look for these healing stem cells, not the ones that make blood, but the healing stem cells, they're called MSCs, mesenchymal stem cells. There's, you know, nomenclature, but I call them an MSC. They're a medicinal signaling cell is another name for them. They're the center of all this healing. I would have almost none in my bone marrow. 
But were you to go take a little liposuction, which I've had twice now taken, a little bit of fat, pull it out and compare it to my bone marrow, it's this hugely rich source of cells, even in older animals. So I think the oldest dog we've done is 19. The oldest horse we've done is in its 20s. The oldest cat, I think, is over 20. And the oldest human in my first clinical trial was 94. Whoa. They all, when they're old, you keep your stem cells in your fat and in and around the blood vessels. They, they sort of sit there as a reserve for emergency in the future. Whereas the bone marrow is making blood all your life and, and you kind of burn them up. So we have cells around our blood vessels, every place in the body, in your brain, which we'll talk about in the nervous system, everywhere. And that's the cell we're trying to harness. All we're trying to do is take that, that cell, extract it out, not muck with it don't don't change mother nature and use it in its sort of most natural form and provide it back in a concentrated format that's it so there is so there really is no no difference in the the stem cells from uh from the fat cells as a source and the progenitor uh, uh, cells that are in the marrow. Yeah, so they're exactly the same. Exactly the same. Yeah, they're, they're probably really, really close cousins. They've okay. got a couple little markers that are different, but this cell has been conserved. And here, here was the, again the other learning that because of what we do, nobody else probably knows this, and I'm getting ready to write an article on it. We've done 44 species. So you're talking to a veterinarian who's done liposuction on a northern white rhino one of the last three on the planet, liposuction, wow. on an orca, on a turtle, on a zebra, on a cheetah, could go on with all the weird how, animals. How the hell do you do liposuction on a turtle? I didn't know it had any fat. <laughs> Very little. It's actually yeah. quite difficult to get enough fat, but we've treated five different species <laughs> of, of endangered species turtles. Wow. Well, so, so you think, well, so those are really different species, right? Wow. You know, from a human to a dog to a turtle, we've done rays. We did a California condor, birds. We've we've crossed all the lines of really different types of species. The stem cell that we isolate out and look at is almost identical across all of these. So every species needs to heal. So it's one of the most conserved in evolution ways of protecting the body and healing. Because when you have an injury, you got to fix it somehow or you die and if you die you can't reproduce and so having these cells is is really useful so it is the master healing cell and it does a lot of things we didn't know about and we can get into that what what are these cells all the things that they do for us we, we talk about healing or regenerative medicine but that is sort of the core of regenerative medicine is is harnessing these kinds of cells and their byproducts to be able to use to fix tissues and injuries, try to regenerate organs that are damaged, um, and and help us live a more quality life. Which, you, your older guy, yeah, you want him to have a quality life, right? It's we can make them live longer. You can patch them up, put them in the ER, and do stuff. But but we want them to be happy and and just like we do, right? You know, if you've got a bad shoulder, a bad hip, and you're living with pain, that's what we're trying to do is to make them feel better. And so their longevity is quality longevity. I, it's a really big difference than just, Absolutely. you know, being able to get treated and live longer, but you're still kind of miserable. Absolutely. We, we play Kung Fu Pyrenees and, and uh, as of late, he's not been much of uh we haven't been sparring much. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. so we got to get Indiana, Indiana back to normal, but I, I'm fascinated about these, these, these stem cells, which seem to be like some type of ancestral cells that are common to yeah, all yeah. of us. So, yes. well, we, so we know we know that we can get them from uh, a different source, from adipose tissue or, or, or whatever. And so the next question is, and this is something that I do want to get into, is uh, can you tell us precisely, we know they help regenerate uh, wounds and aging tissue, but how, let's talk about the mechanism of action. How exactly, uh, Bob, Dr. Harmon, how did, they, how did they do that? Bob's, Bob's just fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, or, or, ahead, yeah. It's funny in practices, Angie, right? They, they probably call you Dr. Angie all the time. People people like to, to, to at least address you that way. Oh, but I, I, get I, called, I get called many things. So. Hey, you sometimes too. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to first really ask, <laughs> I want to ask Angie to describe. So take one of your really interesting cases and, and describe 
from when you put the cells in, what do you see? Like a, an animal that's in pain or distress. Describe what you see and how long that takes. That's important lead in to the mechanism. Right. And so I'm still caught up on the turtle and the orca and the rabbit. <laughs> like I'm still we'll like, mind blown. Because because yeah. I've done yeah. I've done dogs yeah. um and for arthritis yeah. and I've done I've done dogs with uh kidney disease, liver disease. Um yeah. the most recent thing, I, this is the best case. I, and and a couple of things I just wanted to point out too from a veterinarian standpoint. One of the first questions after we get back past the price point, because it is costly. <laughs> right. But and and Again, I'm a data person, but I got to see it work. And my most recent case was the first cat I've ever done. This cat came in with stomatitis. Just all teeth had been extracted. Um, bad, by bad mouth teeth. inflammation, oh, right? Pain. Yes, inflammation. Yeah. Uh. Just and, and all the teeth had been extracted by a board-certified veterinary dentist. So I knew there were no roots in there. So I did y'all stem cell protocol. That cat came back in two weeks. Happier cat. All the inflammation gone. All I did was gave an IV dose. And I was, my mind was, I've done many of these cases, but my mind was just blown on that one because, and my only regret is I did not take a pre-op photo. Uh, I should have taken it. I know, I know. It's it's, it's Uh, okay. So so what, what was the cat's comment if they could have talked? What, what did we do for the cat? What did the cat, what did the cat like? The pain, right? Oh my gosh. Like this cat was so mean before yeah. and and it would gum you it couldn't bite you but it would gum you like you try right. to get near its mouth right. but it was right. such a and even the owner was like and her husband's a neurologist she was like oh my gosh my cat is so much nicer at home because it wasn't in pain um the other question i get from clients a lot is can you remove the lipoma and use the lipoma <laughs> and i'm like no no yeah. So, yeah. So we're, yeah. and, and yeah. another important factor is so so we usually collect i usually collect falciform ligament where they were attached to their mamas you know in utero the falciform is usually rich in stem cells however i found the hard way in an older dog one time and this goes back to what you were saying how our stem cells go can go away i collected falciform and it didn't have enough stem cell in it because this was a very old dog and so where do we go to we go to the omentum which is a lacy structure in the body that that kind of protects the intestines and stuff like that but that is very rich in stem cell too so in my older patients now i automatically just from trial and error and vet stem educating me i collect more of that and you get just so many stem cells from that i love to always see the yield of you got one or (laughs) million million cells you got and it's it's crazy um but I think that cat is the one that I just cannot get out of my mind. Um, how, how yeah. just the difference, I mean, it was like blood red and then it's normal in two weeks. Yeah. Crazy stuff. Good. So, so that? what's yeah. that black box? Yeah. Bob? So tell, us, <laughs> tell us your secret. Proprietary. <laughs> now, so, you know, learning is a process and it's over mm-hmm. time. Right. And so veterinarians like Angie, cats like this cat, Dogs and horses have all educated me about what cells do. Because in the beginning, we all thought, you take this thing called a stem cell, right? Remember embryonic stem cells were the big argument. And, you know, you got, yeah. that's the only place oh, you could yeah. get them. And, and they turn into a tissue. So, so let, let's say, uh, let, let, let's say Ginger has a, a, a scar, she doesn't look like she has any scars, but she might. She's old enough to have a few scars. Emotional scars, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But she, she has a scar, <laughs> and she says, um, "I'd like to make that go away." Or, or Luke, I Luke. Pro- Let's see. So, so you're probably a um, dark beer guy, right? Am I guessing right? Or are you a uh, margarita guy? Huh? Well, probably used to be a more, more of a margarita guy, actually. <laughs> okay. Well, so let's say you're a margarita guy and you say, you know, I'm in, I had too many margaritas over my life. My liver's got inflammation and some scarring. I want to fix that. I want stem cells because it'll make me a new liver, right? That's what everybody thinks about stem cells. They make new tissue. And you can put them in a little Petri dish and you can convince them. And it was the original hallmark, but you could convince them to turn into various tissues. Remember Angie in the course, I have the picture of the beating heart. You can put stem cells in a dish, give them the right feed, the right simulation, and they'll turn into beating heart, literally on their own beat in the, in the dish. So everybody thought this now will cure anything. You can just replace every tissue in the body that has a problem. And so that's how we started thinking. So I'm treating joints thinking I'm going to replace all the cartilage. 
the horses and the dogs taught me that if you go back and look, you don't always replace cartilage. You can sometimes, and, and it is something we work on. But what's the outcome for a painful joint? I just gave you the clue. Make the pain go away, doc. Um, that's what we want. If if you had left the, the gums really red and angry looking, but all the pain went away, that cat would have been just as happy as if you make the red go away, right? You yeah. and I want to see the red go away because it's a signature of we, we made the tissues better. But pain, and so I had veterinarians exactly like Angie that would call me and say, hey, Hey, Bob, I, I don't understand this. It's almost like, you know, they walk off the needle and they go out to the car and the pain's already going away. Uh -huh. And I said, mm -hmm. we didn't grow any cartilage and we, we didn't probably make all the inflammation go away yet. And, and so I kept thinking, I'm sure there's something here. Sure enough, about six years later, the folks at Case Western Reserve, Dr. Arnie Kaplan, who's the grandfather of stem cell, he named the mesenchymal stem cell, close friend and good colleague of veterinary medicine. He speaks at our meetings. He discovered, along with some other folks at Cleveland Clinic, um, that there's a little peptide made, a little molecule made out of these cells that binds at the nerve receptor and acts like morphine to turn off pain. So it's the first thing that happens is the pain turns off. You go, well, so, but wait a minute. So how did that, how does that last? This cat may last a year. It might be permanent that it's turned mm -hmm. off. So we know the cells also interact with the rest of the immune system and they turn off, shockingly, they turn off autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. So we could go around and name the autoimmune diseases and who we know. You know anybody with MS? You know anybody with ALS? Yes. You know anybody with rheumatoid arthritis? Lupus. You know anybody? Uh, uh, gingival stomatitis, which is the mouth deal in the dog. Um, autoimmune uh, uh, hematology diseases, like they yeah. kill the red cells. So these cells have now been clearly shown when you inject them IV, which is what Angie did in this case, they go to the heart of the matter, which is actually in the lymph nodes, where these cells that are sort of miscued to attack the gum or to attack the eye or to attack the nerve. It literally causes the ones that are activated to deactivate and blocks the activation of new ones. So it turns off both the pain and the inflammation. That's the direct thing you want, but it actually works at the heart of the disease to help turn it off. And, and so if it just keeps getting reactivated, by the things we might do by surface treatment. And so, Angie, you've probably treated, well, you don't treat cats, right? But stomatitis cats, what do people treat with? All the immune suppressive uh, drugs, yeah. you know, steroids, all the things that cause mm -hmm. all these side effects. And you go, well, we got to do something because a cat can't eat. Right. Um, but then you put the cells in there and it turns off this problem without suppressing the immune system. It's a very specific. And you go, well, you know, it's like the joke with the with the thermos, right? You know, you put hot water in, it keeps it hot. You put cold in, and it keeps it cold. How do it know? Yeah, you yeah. Know, how do these cells yeah. know? And there's still a lot we don't know about how. But again, they're the central balancing cell in in the immune system. So when you have an autoimmune or an injury, it goes there, it does the work, and then it turns off. Our problem with drugs that we use every day is you have to know when to turn them off, take them off, and they have all kinds of unintended consequences, um, you know, and the cells, that's what they do for a living. And so that's why I don't want to muck with them. We'll we'll have smart cells. We'll have AI enhanced stem cells someday, probably. But well, right, well, right I now. Gonna, I, gonna, I was definitely going to get to that at some point, uh, yeah, but, the potential for artificial and synthetic stem cells. Yeah. But I'm stuck. I'm stuck on something, and and you're, you go so fast, and you're so I know, sorry. Got so much data. I'm I I'm seriously trying to take notes to keep up with you. So I have a question here. Yeah. So, so the pathway is not entirely clear, but we know that it down down regulates the inflammatory yeah. process. Yeah. Without stopping the the necessary yeah. immune response to yeah. fix and correct and okay. prevent infection and so on. So is that a fairly <laughs> accurate description? That, that, that is. And these cells have biosensors. Right. So all cells do, but these in particular. So let, let's say your dog with a hip pain. 
So in there are going to be some things called cytokines that are the inflammatory ones. You heard about, you know, with COVID patients, the cytokine storm, you know, and, and one of them, uh, I'll just pick one called IL-1 interleukin one. It's one of the ones Angie and I studied in vet school. It's one of the bad actors in the joint. So when your joint gets injured or it starts to get wear and tear, there's little pieces in there and it gets inflamed. You could take a little sample and it has IL-1, which causes the inflammation to be smoldering for lifetime and continue to degrade the cartilage in the joint. So one of the things we early on found out about these cells, if I take the stem cell and I put it in a little Petri dish, and I take and sprinkle a little IL-1 in there, a little inflammatory cytokine in there. Those cells immediately get activated and they produce IRAP, IL-1 receptor antagonist, long gobbly gook medical words. <laughs> the receptor antagonist means it goes and binds and blocks the IL-1 from doing its nasty stuff. It's like an antidote to IL-1. It also produces a whole array of things that are antidotes to overactive inflammation. So it turns down inflammation. And, and that's hugely important because then the body can often heal itself. You know, patient heal thyself. It's, right. a, it's a common statement. It's true. Um, but you have to turn off the inflammation. One of the ones that we have in the dog that we don't treat and we don't know how to measure is traumatic brain injury from all the hit by cars. I mean, how many of you seen in your life, Angie? And we know there's an injury there and we try to deal with the emergency stuff. But if you know anybody that's had a car accident or a, a, a you know, wartime injury to the head, they talk about this long term uh, degradation of brain function. It's just inflammation in the brain. It got banged around. It's got inflammation. Our next study in humans is to treat traumatic brain injury wow. for wow. that exact purpose. Uh, all, all we're using is this cell for its natural function. I always come back. These cells, that's what they do for a living. Right. They balance, turn off inflammation, turn off pain. Uh, right. They do, by the way, this is I learned this from dogs. They, they uh, can be used in an infected inflamed area. So that hmm. mouth injury... Or if you have a, a, a septic joint, meaning you have bacteria yep. in the joint along with that. I used to tell veterinarians, oh, no, no, don't put the stem cells in. You treat the infection first with antibiotics <laughs> and then put the stem cells in and we'll try to repair it. These stem cells produce, drum roll, antibiotics. Wow. Wow. Oh. You go, wow. oh, well, why, would they, why would they do that? Well, think about it again. Your paper cut. What happened? It's right. open now, right? Sure. Well, all the stem cells that are in there in the fat, in and around the blood vessels, they're ready to go. When they see a bacteria, they produce these little peptides that are antibacterial. You go, okay. So now I'm building the, I'm answering your question in a long time, but the mechanism of action, it's the mechanisms of action, right. Right. how they function with pain. Now we know inflammation, they make antibiotics. So what about this whole regenerative thing? Like how, how do they do that? So if, if Angie went back and did MRIs or scopes and joints, she would see some regeneration of the cartilage. In that mouth, that mouth regenerated, right? Gum tissue regenerates pretty quickly if you stop mm -hmm. the the, oh, yeah. the damage. But you go, wait a minute, there were all ulcers there. There were, you know, or skin, it regenerates. So these cells, although you can make them turn into a tissue, and people that want to tout stem cells say, my stem cells make cartilage better than yours. You know, mm -hmm. my version, my umbilical cord cell make cartilage. It's not what they do for a living. You can make them do that. They have the ability to do that. And in certain circumstances, like we're trying to regenerate nerve, it might be important. But you used a term, Luke, that's an important term, progenitors. So a true, true stem cell, by the definition, could make every tissue in the body and recreate a whole. That's what embryonic stem cells can do. The reason I use the term medicinal signaling cell is now you're getting the feeling this this stem cell we're using, this MSC, is managing all of this healing. And in regeneration, it does the same thing. For example, um, 
I'm going to go back to your liver, Luke, you know, too, too many of those margaritas. Well, so you'd like to regenerate liver, right? Um, and get some more tissue there. If you had a uh, nerve injury, you know, we see them in our car, uh, hit by car dogs, they have nerve injury in their back in some place. So you want, you want it to do regenerative in every tissue. There is a basic progenitor cell, but it's already what I call a committed. So it's already decided they're major in college. They're committed to something, not that you can't change, but that, that cell is committed to be, for example, a liver cell. They actually reside in the little ducts in the liver, and they're there when you get injury to crawl out and then become a liver cell. That's what they do. Well, the mesenchymal stem cell or medicinal signaling cell, when there's injury in a, in a tissue, goes there and they produce some really interesting fertilizer growth factors, but it's fertilizer for the progenitor cells. And if you watch them, you can actually see when you put the mesenchymal stem cell there, it looks around and it says, ah, oh, there's some interesting injury here. It puts out these growth factors and the new liver cells called hepatocytes. So you'll get new liver formation. They all talk to each other. All these cells cross talk, right? It just right. is. It's all it's all connected, and it's even more intricate than than we imagined. For example, let's say you had a heart attack, Luke. Maybe maybe there are too many In and Out burger. Oh, you guys don't have In and Out burger back there. Well, <laughs> remember your favorite burger joint. You 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 have too many burgers, and so you have a heart attack. Well, so what's the problem? The problem is there's not enough oxygen to your heart muscle. Angie, we have the same thing in cats, right, with the saddle thrombus. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you get a plug in a vessel, and now all of a sudden you have what's called ischemia. Poor. So it turns out that's one of the extremely powerful signals to attract stem cells to an area because it's an emergency, right? You know, and so these cells would go there, and we would see them produce growth factors that make new blood vessels. But that that takes a while to do. So how is it that if you inject these after a patient has a stroke, that you can reduce the size of the stroke? There's something else going on. Again, I'm going, what's the mechanism? Nobody's published this yet. Well, again, then all of a sudden, three or four years later, they show, oh, well, these cells do some other interesting things. The folks at UC Davis actually showed in these photo uh, micrographs showed. So now I have a dying heart cell in, in Luke's heart. And the stem cell now rushes in the bloodstream and crawls out in the tissue and recognizes that cell's dying, right? Not dead yet, but it's dying. You can't make this stuff up. This sounds like, you know, yeah. science fiction, but the cells have these little microtubules. So it sends that little microtubule, you know, like in Star Trek to the dying cell and they send down growth factors, but more importantly, mitochondria which is the powerhouse to rescue that cell. It's like artificial respiration cell to cell. And so now you have fewer dead cells to have to try to reproduce and regenerate. So they're useful in acute injury to help cells from dying. Um, so there, there's, you, well, hold on a second, before you go any further, you, 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 I'm, I'm overloaded. I'm totally, I, I got I so many like a thousand so many questions, questions too. I know, I know. And there, and there are, and, and every veterinarian yeah, and every person who hears this kind of story, that's what happens. It's like, oh, it's an overload. Yeah. And what, they do all these things. At the beginning, we didn't know any of this. 2002. Okay. We well, literally my, didn't my, know any my, of this. My layperson brain is going to explode, unlike unlike veterinarians. So let let me start off with a couple of, of questions and things I want to go over. So so you you said something important, uh, uh, Dr. Harmon, is that is that most people think immune system is good, and that's and and, and, and while that's true, most in most cases the immune system can go very wrong, right, and be detrimental and even deadly. So to to kind of to to summarize what stem cells do then is they have they they really uh, manage uh, and uh, uh, I would say manage maybe a good word the, balance balance the inflammatory immune response yeah, yeah. so that it doesn't get out of yeah. control they control the inflammatory process and then while they're doing that they then are involved in the replacement and repair yeah. a repair process yep heal that wound site or that yeah, yeah. damaged site is that a yeah. is that fairly accurate yeah you're, you're you've got it 
Yeah. Okay. So Jack, it, 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 remind it, me, it, remind me one thing I want to go over because I just lost a dog to a metastatic mast cell cancer. As you know, that's a massive inflammatory, yeah. inflammatory response. Yeah. Got out of control, and he yeah. could be saved. But uh, so I want to want to talk about that as a potential indication of of, of, of use for stem cells. Okay. But, um, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Let's talk cancer for a second because it's right. the most common question I get. Angie, you probably get it too. Somebody yeah, has can an I animal. Say, can yeah. I say one thing about because this is a good segue. Yeah. So that same cat I had um, that with the stomatitis, it also had been vomiting. Middle aged cat vomiting, potential weight loss. So I thought to myself, this could be intestinal lymphoma. And before I inject this cat with IV stem cells, I got to make sure. So before we even, when I collected the stem cells, I got full thickness intestinal biopsies. Came back as inflammatory bowel disease. Awesome. So I went ahead with treatment. That cat has not vomited. So I not only treated the stomatitis, I had treated the inflammatory bowel disease, but I had to make sure that we did not have yeah. cancer first. Go for it, Dr. Harmon. Well, so <laughs> let, let, let's stay with that theme for a second before we go to cancer, because it's really important, right? So how these cells work. Um, so autoimmune disease, Luke, you just brought that up. The things, the immune system when it goes wrong. So dogs get and cats get dry eye. That's an attack of the immune system on the lacrimal gland. So now you get no tears and the eyes get, get cataracts and ulcers. Inflammatory bowel disease. Not a very nice disease, hor horrible disease to get. Um, it's the immune system attacking the cells in the bowel. Uh, you get um, disease where you get an anemia. It's the immune system attacking the red cell progenitors. Which ones am I missing, Angie? Um, uh, autoimmune diseases you see in dogs and cats. Um, I mean, you've said IMHA, ITP. I mean, there's uh, probably some I'm not thinking of. But, yeah, I mean, but so, I, I mean, I guess if you look at skin yeah. like pemphigus or something like that. Uh, pemphigus and lupus. You hear people that yeah. have lupus, uh, you know, the skin disease. It's the immune system attacking there. Stomatitis, the immune system attacking yeah. the gums. Um, uh, MS in people, it's the immune system. Ta it's all part and parcel of the same thing. And Dr. Tuttles, the 11 o'clock is here. Dr. Tuttles, 11 o'clock is here. The, 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 um, the things that cause those, we don't know. Sometimes it's a viral infection. You know, people that get a viral infection and then all of a sudden they have some horrible meningitis um, and the immune system attack. These cells can treat all of those things because they all, they're all they doing the same thing. They're, they're balancing the immune system. So when you get somebody that gets treated with intravenous, which goes every place in the body, these cells, they migrate to areas of inflammation. So they, they know where to go. And so if there's an immune dysfunction that's going on, you sometimes see all these things happen at the same time. You're treating one thing, but you know, a, a patient has a problem, the owner looks at it and says, well, the eyes got, it just got dry. I have to put all these drops in there. They may have some IBD stuff going on or something else going on that they don't even sort of think about. But again, the owners and the vets would call me and say, hey, we treated this, but we saw that. Could this do something? The first liver disease I ever treated in a dog, I wasn't treating liver disease. and But we had all the blood work because the veterinarian did a good job on the blood work. And it had really high liver enzymes, which indicated liver inflammation. We were treating an orthopedic condition along with an IV and the liver enzymes came back to normal. I don't want to give the impression this is the panacea for every disease is not. We see some magic ones like Angie saw with the gums, but we're still learning what's the dose, how to give it. And so exactly like she described, every time there's an odd and interesting case, Angie will call and she either gets gets Dr. Hale or me and we talk through it. Um, you know, does it make sense? I'll send her papers. Here's some papers in a different species that that support the concept this might work and then we try some we collect good data and then after a while we go this really works you know but there's some that it doesn't work really well on and if you want to segue to to degenerative myelopathy in the dog dm which is a horrible disease it's like als in the human um we can help for sure but we can't cure it we haven't figured out the magic there yet, but we have cases where we go, we can prolong their life. They now can move better. They can um, go outside on their own 
you know, for a period of time, but yeah, we haven't figured it out. So people shouldn't think these are magic and they don't cure everything. And in particular, well, yeah. these cells don't cure cancer. Yeah, look, that, that's exactly yeah. where I want to stop right there yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and continue with that thread right there is yeah. We, yeah. We've, we've already discussed that there, there are potentially a whole host of yeah. indications and reasons to use stem cells. Yeah. And we still are, yeah. are trying them for new diseases, trying exactly. them. Exactly, exactly. Dr. Yeah. Angie is over there. So let's talk about uh, about the, the, the cases or the diseases that we know that stem cells yeah. do not work in. Uh, I've never been asked it exactly like that. I can tell you what we what we don't do, and I tell you why. So, in cases of cancer, the stem cell itself is probably not a direct therapy. It works in the immune system for the body trying to treat cancer, but they do a couple of things that you now know. Um, they 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 make blood vessels in areas where there's not good oxygen. That's how tumors work, often solid tumors. You know, they're in an area and, and they block off the immune system and they create their own blood vessels. And so there is a theoretical problem that if you had a tumor already and you gave IV stem cells a big dose, would it make it worse? I got to tell you, I don't have a lot of data that it does make it worse, even with ones, because you sometimes you make that decision. Let's, let's say your fuzzy butt um, had a bone tumor in the, in the front leg you know, an osteosarcoma. Those are nasty tumors. We know they probably metastasize other places and often you remove the leg, right? And so you, you remove the leg and they can get around as a tripod uh, for a while, but we know that that's kind of a nasty disease and it probably is gonna come back. But you call Angie and Angie calls me and, and you say, you know what? This dog also had really bad arthritis because it's an older dog. And in the one leg that's left in the front, it's really painful. Can't really get around. Now it's you having to use one leg. Can't we use stem cells? And I would say, absolutely. It's a balance of risk. And one of the things we do for that is we would say, well, treat just in the joint, not intravenously. The cells don't leave the joint. They stay there. We actually have a study showing that. So now you can use it for pain management in an older dog where you're trying to give them six months or a year of good life um, and happier life. So you can use that. In the future, we will have modified stem cells that carry smart bombs. And we actually already have the technology to put a virus that will kill a tumor or a drug that will kill a tumor inside of a, of a stem cell. So you, you now all know the mechanisms. And I told you these cells migrate. So where do they go to? They go to inflammation. What do tumors do? They make inflammation. So if you inject these cells with a smart bomb just in the blood vessel, they'll find the little tumors, go there, home there, and drop their bomb. Well, Dr. No, Dr. Norman, why, that's the well, that's the future. I, I, I'm excited about the future, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and it's, it's exciting. But I, I I'm stuck on what are the theories of why stem cells don't work with cancer? Because you just said it perfectly. You framed it out perfectly. Cancer. Most people uh, think cancer is a static quantity. It's not. It evolves. Right. It creates right. an, through angiogenesis. It creates right. its own blood vessels. It creates yes. its own uh, energy fuel. Uh, uh, cells yes. is, 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 yes. is the theory is a prevailing theory that maybe the cancer cells are so powerful that they compete and overpower the stem cells is it yeah. competition what's the thought yeah it's pretty unknown um it's pretty unknown i i think and it's there's a there's a complicated rabbit hole to go down sure. would be glad to do it when we have more time sometime because right, right. like <laughs> i i have a theory on that having looked at a lot here. of it a lot of animals. Um, and so we may have ways to use them for that. But the reason I was so cautious at the beginning is this is a new technology, right? When Angie started 2008, like not very many small animal vets had used this. What are the typical kind of dogs we treat for the main indication, which is orthopedic? Right. Old dogs. Yeah. Right. What happens with old and big dogs, right? <laughs> what happens yeah. with old big dogs? Yeah. They all get tumors. Right. And so yeah. I was really worried that if we were treating a dog with an existing tumor or we treated dogs and, and the stem cells got blamed that it would damage the technology and the, and the vision of it. So I've always been really conservative. But a one-on-one -on -one when, when somebody calls me and said, I've got this condition and I want to treat, but I'm also treating for this tumor, um, I, I, I have a, uh, it's just a balance of risk. 
Yeah. And I think the risk is really low to make the tumor worse, but it's still a real risk. And we don't want to, we want to be full disclosure. Sure. Well, and, and if you look on their website, there's a story on a dog I did, Reggie Epperson, mean as a snake dog, but, <laughs> but 12 years old, had a soft tissue sarcoma on the left front leg that we could not get clean margins. And the only option was amputation. Yeah. Owner was hesitant because historically this dog had hip dysplasia. And yeah. so we made the case, we, we amputated the front leg. And I did not give an IV dose, but I gave um, uh, <laughs> injections yeah. in the hips and the front leg. This dog is doing amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm so glad we did it. And we got clean margins on the sarcoma yeah. when I took off the leg. So, yeah. you know, but it was one of those things. And I think I talked to y'all and I said, I, I just yeah. don't, we didn't want to risk it. Yeah. You know, this dog's doing so good. We don't yeah. need to give an IV yeah. injection. Right. The intraarticular working just fine. Yeah. So is yeah. the dog still mean as a snake? Yeah. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Absolutely. <laughs> some of them are mean. Some of them are mean because of the pain. Some of them are just mean. Exactly. Just like people. Just some some people are, are the same way, right? Some cell therapy doesn't help personalities. I don't think they can. Help that. Well, uh, you know, it well, helped the cat. So it does. Yeah. It does if the personality is being be, because of pain. Right. Sure. But, you know, and, and yeah. that 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 that's really common. But the the things that we treat that we don't have really good outcomes yet. We're still learning. One is degenerative myelopathy, that back mm -hmm. deal, you know, the, the yeah. nerve repair, that's not even known. We don't even know as vets what the real cause is and why. So, so th those are a little tough. Um, uh, spinal cord injury. Uh, yeah. It's a tough one. Um, we've used it in some for sure, and it can help some, but we don't know a lot. Um, the areas that are maybe a little, we know more, but still not there yet, are uh, liver disease and and uh, kidney disease. Cats is yeah. the biggest problem, right? Cats get chronic mm -hmm. kidney disease. We probably treated 400 now. And we've mm -hmm. got data. It's not magic. And one of the problems that we have, trying to understand the mechanism and how it applies to a disease, if, if you came in and saw Angie and she says, your cat has kidney disease you think it's a thing unless she spends an hour with you and says you realize that kidney disease is not kidney disease it's highly complex it could be caused by viral it could autoimmune it could be congenital when they were born with it so there's all these different combinations so if we don't really study it carefully we don't know which of the kidney disease work best because some of them you know like that cat that angie treated that's magic i mean that is like magic right i like, was shocked I, I honestly Look, but we've talking. also treated ones where we have to go back and retreat and over again and it makes it better but doesn't cure it it's i'm sure it's because it's a in that particular cat it's a different disease could have been a different cause so we really try to be the best scientist we can while being you know a commercial lab and do right. both so yeah. we understand them really well which things work and which things don't because the first question the patient will ask angie after cost <laughs> What's the probability this is going to work? Hey, doc. And then after that, when you don't give them a really clear answer, they say, doc, would you do this if it was your cat? Right. It's the, it's the sequence that always yeah. happens. <laughs> would you do this if it was your kid? You know, it's always the question. Um, and so we, we're trying to get this data where we can give better answers for all of this. We understand so much at the beginning. I was embarrassed, actually, to go out and ask a horse owner to try this, you know, or veterinarian to try this. And I said, you know, we're the first ones on the planet to ever do this in a real live big animal. But I am sure from what I saw that it will help. And then we learn from the animals. The one thing I got to tell you that is that maybe, maybe it's the, the first question somebody asks, is it safe? And I can tell you 25,000 animals, 40,000 treatments, because lots of animals get repeat treated. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell you if I've actually ever seen a real um, adverse reaction that's caused by the cells. Sometimes it's a disease. Sometimes it's because they've got an autoimmune thing going on that there could be, but it's generally pretty safe. And she's yeah. had an adverse reaction in an animal before, you know, what we think is an adverse reaction. Um, I, I think the stuff you read about, you know, if you don't use them right, or you contaminate them, they have bacteria in there, you don't process them right. You know, uh, there can be problems, but as a modality in my, and I've done drug development, I probably got written a thousand papers to the FDA on various kinds of drugs. I have never seen anything like this. It's why it got me so excited. You know, using your own cells 
is such a spectacularly safe way to do something, it's easy to balance the risk reward. You know, it's not like there's there's no risk, but but it's easy to balance that. But, but well, and I will say since since I started doing it, I get approached by companies all the time trying to sell me stem cell equipment. Right. Yeah. And I will not do it in my clinic because yeah. I cannot guarantee the yeah. pureness of it. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I trust vet stem a hundred percent. And we, and we got it. It would be nice. I'm sorry, Luke. Go ahead. I didn't well, that, that was my question just for clarification yeah. is that the, the main risk for yeah. like the number one cause of adverse yeah. events then would be uh, a secondary nosocomial infection, something like that. Yeah, that's yeah. the number one problem that would the uh, number one risk. It, but but that yeah. risk is not very is negligible. Well, and that's why I got offered all these devices that they, they come to Angie's door as well. You know, here this is a great device. The, the vet can process it right there. Human side, there's a number of them out there. The illegal devices, but you go. How do you take a technician who's never been a stem cell tech and have them process on the table in your little in your clinic and take tissue out and do it and then put it back in. I said, no, I just won't do it. And I, I've been offered the most amazing deal. And I said, no central lab where I've got, you know, all the FDA oversight, all of my technicians, all the safety testing. And, you know, like we, we, ran hundreds of samples before we ever treated even a single animal to know that how we process it gets it sterile yeah. so that we're not going to put bacteria back into an animal. Cause you know, do no harm. It's right. our first, you know, we, yeah, yep. so. This is a perfect time for us to walk through the process. Angie, I want yeah. you to walk, let's say I walked in with Indiana like I just did a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago, yep. and we think we're looking at osteoarthritis. That's what we're looking at. So so let's say that we all agree it's it's osteoarthritis. That's what we're looking at. We agreed to do uh, a stem cell therapy. So so now take take us, take me from what's next. Do I bring Indiana and you have to harvest mm -hmm. the cells? Take us through that, that entire chain and then on the vet tech and then had the back to re yeah. So basically I usually collect on a Tuesday. Okay? okay. And so what that means is we are in sterile, like I'm doing a sterile surgery here. I make about a, Oh, I try to keep it around two to three inch incision um, on their abdomen. Right. If you know where their little belly button is, I usually go a little bit above that. Um, I go in there and I collect what I can. I, you know, again, I talked about in older dogs, I get a lot of momentum because that's very rich in stem cells. I sterilely put it in the two um, tubes provided, uh, package that up, FedEx it overnight to California, at which point the, and I, I can't say enough good things about the, your staff, Dr. Harmon over at VetStem. They're they really are, exceptional. Well, yeah. I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've befriended many of them and, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and they, we usually have a fast turnaround rate. They send them back to me by Thursday and then we come in, I give a light sedative and then I inject them all into the joints. Okay. So, um, so, so Bob, so so they come, yeah. they come to you. You get the well. So, so man, you got to back up here for a minute because Angie made that sound like that's really simple and easy. <laughs> Before we allow a veterinarian to do this, okay. we have to make sure they went to vet school, right? <laughs> Is it? I'm telling you, like it's important, right? Sure. Yeah, we okay. only deal with licensed, qualified okay. veterinarians. Mm -hmm. That can and we make them take a course with us. We don't just say, "Oh, here you can just oh, collect fat." That's, and yeah, that's true. I yeah, should have said it, that. It's really easy, right? It's just like doing a spay. I mean, it's the same yeah. kind of surgery oh, as a spay. Maybe it's, it's easier. easier. Actually. It's easier. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's what like an owner would know. Oh, oh, it's just like a spay. Okay, it's a quick, it's a quick surgery. Yeah. But, but the problem is, she needs to know how to use the cells yeah. and know sure. how, how the collection, how our box system works. So it's really slick once they learn, but literally we will turn people down. No. Oh, you don't want to spend the four hours to learn oh, yeah. what the technology is about. Sorry, your clinic can't use this. So it is really important. You know, right. it's, it's not highly complex, but you know, like her staff need to know. So oh, yeah. now she's done well, that, but she also needed to get a box, right? Like a collection kit. Yeah. We spent a year developing this, what looks like a simple box with styrofoam and the tubes and, you know, so that it's a sterile, simple kit so that it's not complex to use with a little ice pack in that. But, you know, her staff needed to learn how to use that. So they, right. they've put the time in to be a oh, provider absolutely. of this for sure. Yeah. Well, and being able to hit joints with the needle, <laughs> uh, it's taken me many years. And I've even yeah. told your staff, if you have any vets, I can come teach them because yeah. I have dumbed it down to a kindergarten level for myself yeah. to be able to hit these joints quickly and not yeah. have to dig around and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, and okay, so, so so now we have the black box, right? Which is exactly what you said, Luke. So there's the black box here. So Angie just sends it out. FedEx yep. picks it up, and it shows up. And and uh, two days later, back comes the cells in a, in a syringe, ready to inject, mm -hmm. easy to use. That was my goal: is to put the whole process here in a black box. But I can but I can give you the Reader's Digest what we do. Yep. So when it comes in. We have an eight page batch record that this thing goes through, like making a pharmaceutical drug from the time it comes in. So we we check the temperature to make sure Angie's staff sent it with an ice pack and that it stayed cool. Otherwise, we have to quarantine it and treat it differently because, you, you know, bacteria can grow. And and so then we 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 do something nobody would ever guess. So so are, are your your dogs chipped, microchipped? I know. Yes. Oh, yes. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that chip can migrate. Funny enough, yeah. we get this fat, which sometimes comes out of the the uh, under the skin in the belly. It probably wouldn't get there. But we've had fat from horses come in. We scan it with a chip reader. Oh, gosh. in all the ones we've done, we've found a little chip in there that migrated wow. and got to the spot where we took the fat out. <laughs> and so we check that. We look for any contamination. We look for cracks. So we do all the quality assurance. And then it goes and gets given to one of our techs in the lab. And they may have one, two or three samples for the day. It's mm -hmm. in this little blue tube with uh, with liquid in it and the fat's mm -hmm. in there. Then it goes to the lab. The four hour process is to digest away the fat. We don't actually want the fat, wow. the lipid, and we don't want the fat cells, the adipocytes. We don't want those. These mesenchymal stem cells sit in and around the blood vessels in the fat. And, and so when we get the sample, we start the process and it's, we use an enzyme that breaks it up, the connective tissue. Funny enough for us, the fat floats and the cells sink. So the fat, once it's broken up, float to the top. We can spin it in a little centrifuge and then the fat's up at the top. It looks like little chicken fat. And then we dump that off. The cells are at the bottom. And then we do a couple of really important things that matter and, and only could be done in a central lab. We do a cell count. Angie's had the experience. You can't predict from an individual animal. Every once in a while, you get one, they have horrible yields. Well, we can then put more cells in. So it's not just by volume. We actually count the cells. So we know we've got 750,000 cells per each gram of fat that we got. So we've got 12 million cells or 20 million cells. Then we sterilely repackage them once we've washed them multiple times. We repackage them in a syringe in the volume that Angie needs. So for dogs, most of the time, it's in less than one mil. And it's got the, oh, there's a box. Look at that. We have a prop. It is. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's the box that, cut, that that she ships it out in. It comes back in the same box. All right. It's always refrigerated. That's the little sterile tube to collect okay. the, the fat in. And it's got a little uh, 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 scale on the side that tells you each 10 grams of fat, which is kind of like a teaspoon, is probably we're going to get one dose out of that okay. enough cells for a dose. Okay. But we've learned over time how many cells make a dose for a particular condition, whether it's IV, whether it's a, um, a local injection in a tendon or it's an osteoarthritis. So dose is really important. A system that's sitting in your clinic, you can't know the dose. So it's like Angie would never take, I'm sorry, Dr. Zinkus would never take uh, a vial off the shelf that the, the label had fallen off and just oh. go, I think I'll put in a mill or two in there. We just wouldn't do that. But people will do that with cells because they don't understand it. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a very, and if you don't dose right, you don't get the effect that you want. Right. So it's important. So that, and once we're done, and then most importantly, the most important, it's even on a bumper sticker, um, is we always have enough cells to save for the future. So we always we always save at least a retention sample, sometimes multiple doses frozen in liquid nitrogen, like uh, Ted Williams head sitting in that you know freezer. It's, in, it's in liquid nitrogen, but these cells will last 25, 50 years for sure the length yeah. of time of the age of our patients. So now the next time Angie needs to treat your dog. Mm -hmm. 
um, she doesn't need to do a collection again. You don't have to go back for a liposuction. Right. You just have it one time. Now you have a lifetime supply. And so we've either got doses saved or we can grow some more because these cells grow really well in the lab. And then we've got doses for the future. So the next time it's cheaper, easier, no surgery. You just pick up the phone and call. Angie would call, call our group or her tech would call our group and say, hey, uh, uh, Dr. Robinson's dog. What's your dog's name? I forgot already. Indiana. Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones. How could I forget? Indiana yeah. Jones needs yeah. another dose. They look up right where you're on the phone. Yes, we've yeah. got three doses ready. How many do you want? What day do you want them on? Then they pull them out. They thaw them. They do a cell count again to make sure they're mm -hmm. good. And they put the appropriate dose in the syringe, send it back in that same box. Now, Dr. Zinka's team opens it up, has it prepped for her, ready in the, in the surgery room. Yeah. And, and then she does the injection. Were you well, and a common question I get too from clients is how often do you have to re-inject? And again, I'm on a smaller um, scale of, you know, of yeah. my own personal experience, but usually about a year, usually about a year to mm -hmm. a year and a half, I re-inject. Yep. So, and it varies by animal. We, we've had some say I, we can verify it here at Fuzzy Butts and Friends that you actually keep and store the, the material, <laughs> the tissue for a long yeah. time because, yeah. thank goodness, you didn't keep Pete's head, but but you have a part of Pete <laughs> still at your lab. Yes. Ginger, ginger called when Ginger contacted you. you yes. Knew her. Tell the story, Ginger, please. Well, I don't think they still have Pete's cells because oh, I, I called when he. Yeah, when he passed, so they didn't have to store them anymore okay. unless they're using yeah. them for research or something. But I did, when I talked to Christy, I said, you know, my dog got a stem cell uh, procedure back. I was like, in 07 or 08. I said, when did you guys start? And she said, 07. So Pete was like on the forefront of yeah. stem cell yeah. replacement. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. They, they, And, you know, we, we've used all of this great information that you've now listened to an hour of all the th stuff right. we've done and how many cases and all the disease and all the publications to be able to now convince the FDA, the human FDA, not the veterinary FDA, veterinary FDA believes us, the human mm -hmm. FDA, they're still earlier in the phase. So when I went in and said, I think we should treat knees in people. I really want to do this. And, and we've got 20,000 patients worth of data, 10,000 patients worth of data, 5,000 knees. And, 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 and they're like, they looked at me and they go, you have what? And I said, well, the, the, all this data is at the veterinary FDA and they couldn't even access it. I had to submit it again, submit data to them um, and show them. And it took them a few months to figure out what this was. And then they came back with a revelation. They said, so this is in mice and rats data that you created the disease and then treated it that you're trying to convince us it works this is actually real diseases they were like it was like a new concept to them that this was real data in real patients right. and i said yes that's why i call them patients they are really patients they're not you know these aren't aren't subjects in a, a trial where we created the arthritis this is these all have real and painful and they let us go faster than any company in the history of mankind 7 months into the clinic and treating people with exactly what we do you would you would laugh if i showed you the boxes and the methods and how we ship them it's all everything we learned in veterinary we just do it in people well i wish we had the same speed in veterinary oncology than we do in in orthopedic <laughs> uh veterinary medicine because it's it, tough. It, it, it it, it's, tough it's like you said translational medicine comparative yeah, yeah, yeah. comparative science we know yeah. that the dogs are great models yeah. Yeah. and and it should the, the, you think the adoption and the the approval process would it would expedite it or accelerate it, but yeah. it doesn't at all. Yeah. Uh, but I, what I love about this conversation, yeah. we are running a little bit long, and yeah. uh, we try to kind of cap it at. But I want to make, but it's just great. It's a great yeah. discussion, and I, yeah. I want to make sure we don't uh, lose anything. But what I, I one of the takeaways I want to reiterate is that most people think that stem cells are are limited to joint uh, stress. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, musculature uh, problems, and yeah. I love it that not only are you expanding yeah. and exploring new disease, uh, new disease pathologies, and potential treatments yeah. and therapies, yeah. but you're also figuring out what works and what doesn't, and then you're also trying to understand what doesn't work. So, is yeah. there anything, uh, Dr. Harmon, uh, Dr. Zinkus, 
Is there anything as we kind of wrap things up? Is there any areas that we haven't discussed that you want to uh, articulate to our, uh, our our audience? Angie, I'll start with you. Doctor, <laughs> I'll start with you. We, what? I, I guess my question is: you you were you were an early adopter. You've been doing this since two thousand and eight. Is that right? <laughs> yes, yes, and yeah. and I think I can go back to my very when I was sold on this because I have to see it to to. To, guarantee, to, to tell my clients to do it, I have yes. to see it work. Yeah. And my very first case was a Weimariner. Um, and I remember I did it and the owner called me the next day and said, Sonny jumped in the back of the car. He hasn't done that in forever. And I was like, yeah. what? Cause like, I, I, yeah. had, I had my, you know, I was like, oh, this can't work. This is voodoo. And it's not, <laughs> it's not voodoo. I, I'm here it seems say, like it, it yeah. Worked. And you know what's interesting? After COVID, the COVID boom, like stem cell be has become very popular and I have no idea why, but I've had so many more cases in the past <laughs> several years than I ever have. So I don't know what to say about that, but I, I'd say vet stem 100% go with them because <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're the real deal. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. You know, it's it, it's it, it's amazing. I'm still kind of amazed that that uh, this isn't used more commonly in, in in sports medicine because, as you know, yeah. that's a huge business. And oh, it yeah. seems like, and I would imagine they would be early or do early adopters to a technology like this. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it, yeah, and it, and it was um, in in the horse world, which is where we started before we ever did dogs. It was all the sports medicine equine lameness guys that were doing that. So we, we treated horses that were running in the Kentucky Derby, the Dubai Classic, um, lots and lots of horses, very high end athletes. But in in veterinary medicine, sports medicine is just now becoming a uh, a thing. There's actually a board certification for sports medicine, mm -hmm. but most veterinarians are not. So half of our clients in small animal are surgeons so they're dealing with bad joints and things and things that they need an adjunct therapy and the other half are general practitioners that that instead of referring them for surgery would like to see if they could do a non-surgical mode of of treating and you know th there will be lots more things done I, to to maybe just a quick comment luke on your oncology studies are expensive. Those drugs are expensive. They're hard to do. So in veterinary medicine, when they, when they want to charge, you know, like three hundred thousand dollars for a treatment, no, we don't we don't do that in veterinary medicine. So it's been hard to take some of the human innovations and drop them back down. But it's all about what it costs to do these things. We're a little company still. It's expensive to run clinical studies, and we still have to run them, as you know, for veterinary. CVM makes us run all those. I'm super excited and to give you a vision of the future. We have licensed the technology to take what's called an oncolytic virus. That means it kills cancer. It's a virus that kills cancer. Oh, Turns out it's a vaccinia virus. It's the same virus, similar, a cousin to what we treat for rabies. And, and it was learned 300 years ago that these viruses, if they get into the system, will help target and kill cancer. The problem is the immune system is so good at, at picking up these viruses, they don't get a chance to treat the cancer. So a company here in San Diego called Kaliti Biotherapeutics on the human side um, discovered along with some help from us, if you take these viruses and put them inside a stem cell, the kind of stem cell we use, exactly our stem cell, and then you inject them, they protect the virus from the immune system long enough for it to get to the cancer explodes inside the cancer. So we're actually trying to raise the money right now to do this study in dogs for these terminal big cancers and see if our already shown to work stem cell can be the Trojan horse to carry the, the That's treatment. That's something else. That's amazing. Yeah, I think, and on yeah. the human side, there's a lot of studies going on, and they're in phase two studies now, meaning they're they're progressed along, and in in mast cell tumors and melanomas and maybe osteosarcomas, some of these that we we really can't treat very well. It may it may in fact be be our our way to treat these. Well, it seems like that that's right there. I, I, I had it in my notes to discuss yeah. this, uh, yeah. so many other things, but it seems yeah. like stem cell therapy is becoming. <laughs> Uh, immunotherapy or their yes the it is. Kingdom, is that the stem cell yeah. therapy would be an adjunct yeah. uh, to to immune therapy 
it is help modulate the, the the immune response it's fascinating it's, so so the, the last case i'll give you it's, and yeah. you can cut me off whenever you want you know i could probably go three days you and i would talk another so, two hours of ginger it, it would be, so uh, so <laughs> so you, you you know you know the story of you know the the irishman and the priest that walks into the bar and you know so this was the story of the the the, the cow doctor and the human orthopedist were sitting in the bar and in walked COVID. <laughs> and so these two not related kinds right. of guys right. said, I wonder what happens in COVID? And we went and looked, you, cytokine storm, massive inflammation, leaky vessels. I, these stem cells should work. And we got on the phone with some doctors in Wuhan and Shanghai, literally, oh. talking to them at night while they're treating patients with stem cells in the middle of COVID outbreak in China, okay. knowing that it's going to land here. And we put together the data. One of your colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Zinkus, uh, down in Texas, small number veterinarian, had treated two West Highland white terriers with lung fibrosis. Huh. And colleagues of yours in Texas had treated horses with lung bleeders, the bleeding phenomena in lungs and horses, the yeah. ru running bleeding with really good effect. So we put together a paper, 30 days, published a paper on the rationale for treating COVID with these stem cells. We went to the FDA, we got an approval, phase one study, UC San Francisco, studies now done, 10 patients in the ICU, Again, you can't make this stuff up. 10 patients in the ICU that were all three of them on ventilator, all going downhill, already treated with immunotherapy, wow. the rapid an monoclonal antibodies, and weren't getting better. Two it weeks two weeks after IV treatment with these stem cells, adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cells, all 10 patients went home off oxygen. Wow. Well, wow. It's, it seems like you have... You, you, you have you have so many more potential applications yeah. uh, for the technology than you do dollars and 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 time time in the lab time and years years yeah. up in your life so yeah. 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 i'm sure you know that the puppy up foundation we fund cancer studies comparative oncology translational so we know we fund <laughs> trials before and uh and uh, i was curious what types of cancers are you potentially looking at uh for these mesenchymal cells uh stem cell therapy and talk, right, what, what are the cancers that you're looking at, right? What are the top cancers that you want to attack right now? Yeah, so they're solid tumors generally because you can inject them directly and put the cells even faster there. They're potentially going to work in all of them. Uh, the lymphomas are probably the highest probability, um, but yeah. melanomas and osteosarcomas are also you know, fairly localized tumors um, that could be treated. You know, we've got a product to treat melanoma in the oral melanomas in dogs. And I, my view is it don't work very well. Um, it, 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 the outcomes are not so good. So those are ones we could immediately get into and run a pilot study and see how they go. There, there are a number of some spectacular veterinary oncologists. I, I am really embarrassed. I didn't know about your foundation and what you did. I know Morris and I know some of the others. Yeah. Uh, and and after after getting invited, I went and looked. You guys are doing some incredible work with people, and really, and so there's some really good veterinary oncologists that want to get stuff done. Most of the sort of university-based studies take a long time to do, a lot of overhead at the university, and and so I typically don't do that but i have private veterinary oncologist brenda phillips is one of them here in san diego you may work with her she's done she did part of the melanoma studies so if we were going to do a study we would do it with some of the big clinics here yeah um but do it in, in a pilot manner do it with fda approval of what we're doing you know we submit to the cvm say this is what we're doing but as you might guess, we we try to move it at, at, at a little more uh, rapid pace than you would in typical big foundation and big university kinds of studies because I, right. I I don't have enough time. No, no, I, I, <laughs> I don't have time. I, not enough time to wait, and and it makes me crazy absolutely. seeing how long it takes. Yeah, absolutely. But, we we we've never gone with the. I'm not sure with what Morris or some of the other foundations, but they have basically the NCI. You have right. the 300 page NCI. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And, 
And so we we have we we have a small yeah. uh, uh, board of medical advisors. Uh, uh, veterinary Excellent. Yeah. I, I count us uh, amongst my friends, Craig Clifford and Phil. Uh, Phil. Um, Oh my God, Bill Bergman. Bill Bergman. 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 Phil, Phil, yeah. Phil is a good friend. He knows me for a long time. Yeah. Well, well, he, well, he and I are both data guys. And as you know, he runs the clinical trials for all of VCA. So yeah. what I yeah. love about Phil is he's offering a lower cost, yeah. 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 cost of clinical trials. And like you yeah. said, the university, right. which Ginger and I, we funded some, some university studies and there's always the indirect, indirect costs and the overhead which which increases it doubles it if not trebles it so i i, I yeah. don't think you and i could talk for a long time and i i have so yeah. many I'd love to talk to you about dr yeah. Harmon, and then potentially yeah. look at a collaboration uh for doing some of these cell uh cancer studies that you, you want to do so yeah. but we're at a time angie yeah. you brought this wonderful group together uh you thank thank you so much <laughs> dr. oh absolutely for yeah for introducing us to, to vet stem we'll know we'll hopefully have a diagnosis with india pretty soon yeah. and then we Great. can talk about whether he's a candidate but offline whatever yeah. you guys need uh dr Harmon, uh, for the puppy up foundation to promote stem cell therapy we also yeah. have swaps we have many ways that we can educate uh pet parents around the country yeah. we're ha happy to help you in your mission as yeah. well. So, Angie, as we wrap well, we, yeah, we, it's really important also, we also do um, pro bono work. You know, we're a little company and we don't have big funding either. But, you know, we have done some really interesting cases where we, you know, somebody comes to us. We did, if you look on our website, look up Lex. Lex, Lex was a military service dog uh, in Afghanistan, got on a roadside bomb, had all kinds of orthopedic problems, and the family couldn't afford to treat. And they were trying to adopt the dog. We ended up treating it, and they ended up getting a congressman step in, and they adopted this military dog. He was a spectacular dog. You know, there's so many important cases where people, they've got it, they've got it, they've got a story. You get them all the time, right? They have the story. They've been touched. It's really important. And, and so, you know, we're always open to look at that as well, you know, yep. We're more limited in size, but we will do that. If Angie calls us and she says, we've got a spectacular case, we really got to do, they're all in, but the, but it's just, they just can't. People save their lunch, kids' lunch money, I think, yeah. to treat with stem cells sometimes. They, they they care as much about them as they do about the rest of their- Well, if we, if we do it for Indiana, I know yeah. I'm going to have to go for mini lunches, mini yeah. days without lunches, because it, it is- Well, let me- let Yeah. yeah. Let me interject. So, um, Indiana has insurance. Oh, and I yes. was oh, calling yeah. about yeah. Um, something else for him that we were doing. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> and um, they said, well, we cover these things that are holistic, you know, that we seem to be, that we deem is holistic. <laughs> and vet, the vet stem um, is covered. Therapy was covered. That's Excellent. the point I wanted to get to make is that pet parents. Um, Please don't, if you're listening yeah. to the audience, please don't immediately shut down and say, well, stem cells is just out of my budget. Right. Because, but it seems like there are uh, financial uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, options out there to help pay. Sure. Insurance, yeah. care credit. We've we've even done co-financing with the veterinarian says, I really want to do this case, please. Can I can I pay your fee that, that's part of this, you know, over time? And the, the owners have agreed they're going to pay me over time. Pet owners are good people. They really are. And, and anybody that's going to this this degree to, you know, for their fuzzy butt, uh, you know, they're good people. We'll do whatever we need to get them treated. I, it also makes me crazy. We have cells stored for patients and they forget about them. They don't they don't get educated, you know, that there's a use for them. And the pet passes away with cells in the freezer and didn't use them. You know, so we send out a quarterly newsletter to every owner of every cell that's in the database and in our freezers to remind them, you know, you can go back, you can use these anytime. It's way cheaper. And and now we have new uses. You know, they thought it was only for the joint. And that's all it could be. But now they've got a, a, a liver inflammation or something else. So, you know, we try to do the outreach. That's where we can use help is letting people know what this really is and that it's not not voodoo. One question before we, as we yeah. wrap this up, that it just came off the top of my mind: Is there ever a case? Because as you know, cells age; they they, they wear and tear, and, and then then yeah. and they mutate, and so on and so. Is there ever a case to have the cells, uh, mesenchymal cells, uh, extracted? And if there's no disease state at all, just have them extracted yeah. and stored in the eventuality that you may. Yeah. Is there ever a case for that? 
Yeah, it's just a super, super question. So, yes, the fact that these don't age very fast and you can get them later is good, except for if later on you now get cancer, like a, like a blood cancer. It's all through your body. It's mixed in with your stem cells. Now you got a problem. Right. So at the time of a spay or neuter, we have a thing called stem insure. <laughs> <laughs> and so for a much less price, it's just like, so if you've ever st seen cord blood cells stored for kids, yeah. that you sort of can't use. This you can use. And so you can store them at a spay or neuter. Literally, Dr. Zinkus is doing a spay and she's taking that fat and dropping it in the mm -hmm. trash. Wow. She could yeah. drop it in that same tube and send it in yeah. and for, I think, what's our cost? $300. Um, we'll process it and store that for even the storage cost is even less. And then in the future, you don't need very much fat, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's now your your sample to make more in the future should you need it. So, yes, you can do that. It's, well, uh, we, it's, need, we need to get that message out there, Ginger, because that yeah. is stuff like yeah. like you said, if, you, if your dog is diagnosed yeah. with a blood cancer, then you you just there's not right. a lot of options. So, or yeah. or there are cases in, and I don't know if you've had them, Angie, where you go. I have one right now I'm working with and they say, I really need to treat this cat for his kidney disease, but he's got two feet on a mm -hmm. banana peel. Yeah. He couldn't stand the collection surgery and the anesthesia, right. but he could really use the stem cells. You go, Oh God, now what do we do? You know? And so having it for the future, which is why in our human company called personalized stem cells, that one is specifically for that store them early. Now you have a heart attack, a stroke, something else where, we can't get your cells easily, you know, it's not safe. You've got them there and then then you can use them. So it should be, I've got a degree, a master's in preventive veterinary medicine. I should be promoting that more. <laughs> this whole preventive, save it and treat early. Don't wait until the last minute uh, is a really good idea. So thanks, Luke. That's a really great question yeah. and important message too. Well, yeah, I, th I think we all need to talk a lot more more about prophylaxis and preventing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that I'm glad we got it in. We got yeah. so much in. I, Angie, I'm going to let you start off with the with the, any last comments uh, to our to the audience that you have. Any thoughts to pet parents out there that you because you're on the ground, you're 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 transforming pet parents' lives and their patients. Any last thoughts you have? Yeah, I mean, I mean, kind of kind of what we've hit on already. I mean, I'm just I'm so thankful that there's a modality like this because you know, we run through NSAIDs, we run through gabapentin, we run through adequin, cold laser, and and this is a modality that that truly works and 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 like we've all touched on, improves quality of life. You know, I'm not, you know, it, it's all about quality, not necessarily quantity, even though if yeah. we could come up with stem cells to keep them alive longer, that would be amazing. But, but it's about that quality of life and, yeah, and seeing yeah. it actually work makes me so happy um, and want to keep, you know, keep going further with this and, and figuring out more and yeah. working with that STEM to, to, to see what we can do to enhance this in the future. Excellent. Um, Dr. Dr. Harmon, any last uh, final thoughts to the audience that you may have? I think we've covered everything, Luke, in terms of, <laughs> of, of the, of the, of the understanding. So now yeah. people can go further. They can go to websites. You can go yeah. Google. You can look up. Just be careful. You've got good source of data because, as you know, there's lots of mess out there. Mm -hmm. But but anybody, go to your veterinarian. You know, everybody that's listening to this has a vet. Well, here's the question for you. Yeah. Can they go to their GP or do they have to yes. go? To, 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 they can absolutely go to their GP right. their, and tell their GP. In fact, they can go to our website, print out a little one pager. Mm -hmm. if, they're, if their GP doesn't understand vet stem, mm -hmm. then they will call us and go, is this for real? Is this voodoo? And we then will educate them. We'll give them free access for the, the certified continuing education so they, they can learn about it because they need to learn. They need to learn how you can use it. And so any veterinarian can do this. I, pet parents parents call me sometime and they go, no, I don't want to go to my GP. I want to go to somebody really experienced in this. And we have a database of 5,000 veterinarians, uh, but yeah. I always encourage, go back to your GP. This is how it's not hard for them to do. I'll coach them, them through them the learning. Learn. And we want them to learn and it's, adopt the technology. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's, go to, go to your vet. If your vet refuses to call and listen, absolutely. You can call back and we'll find you a veterinarian who has done this before and is a believer like Dr. Zink is because that that's what it, I literally have trained 5,000 vets either in person on YouTube like this or on, on, uh, on direct 
in person. So there's a lot of them out there. Uh, not all of them are, are like Dr. Zinkus. They really understand this and apply it appropriately. That uh, She's really taking the time to learn. So what is, uh, Dr. Harmon, what is that website that pet parents can go and print that one page and take it to their GP? Yeah, it's, it's just vet stem, all one word or with the dash, it doesn't matter, dot com. V e t s t e m dot com, and on there, go to the section for for the the animal owners, okay. um, pet owners, and and there's a section for horses, there's a section for dogs. I don't have a section for turtles yet. That may be a, a different piece. But if, if you ever if you ever want to do a segment on exotic animal therapy with stem cells, I've written a chapter in a book, and I and co-authored some articles on that. Um, it really is spectacular because everybody has an affinity for all these rare and endangered species yeah. and, and especially pet parents do, yeah. you know, and, and so th we're trying to really help out there and build this, you know, Noah's Ark of stem cells for right. all these animals. Well, our philosophy here at Fuzzy Butts, even though we say Fuzzy Butts, we're scaly butts and friends, we're yeah. uh, <laughs> butts and friends because yeah. a companion is a companion and it's important to absolutely ensure they have the quality of life for that yep. companionship that means so much to absolutely us. i can't yeah. imagine a better way for us to end the show before we go thank thank you both uh, uh dr Zinkus, dr Harmon. thank you so much Ginger, uh uh it, before we go is there anything i left out or is there anything i know i did uh <laughs> i have to check did i screw something up not this time oh, <laughs> oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I didn't. I'm sure I'm going to go back and listen to it and go, oh, I forgot that point. Oh, I messed that up, too. So, well, thank you, Dr. Yeah, Hallman, thank especially you. for coming on and sharing uh, the passion of yours. You're so passionate about it. You're yeah. transforming the lives of human patients and pet patients as well. And and certainly, Dr. Zinkas, thank you for making the connection. And thank you for everything that you do here in the Memphis Absolutely. area. Uh, and we look forward to following up with Indiana. And I hope he's a good candidate uh, for this project. Hey. If he is, and we go through it. Uh, we will walk. We will make sure that we put this on Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Absolutely. Uh, with treatment through Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Because okay. we like to keep everything transparent. And, and that's just how you learn. Like, like, like you, you bet. I know how it works, but, I, you know, the proof is in the pudding. You know, if it works, it works. And and so, all right. Thank, thank you uh, very much, everybody. Yes. We ran a little bit long, but we... I, <laughs> So many more things I want to talk about. So we probably will have you back on the show, especially for a follow up. So anytime, anytime. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank absolutely. you guys. Um, okay. All right. Uh, as you may know, we drop uh, fuzzy butts and friends every Tuesday. You can find it on your podcast platform, such as Spotify or iHeartRadio, or you can watch this live. We've got four animated fun. You got to watch the video on this guys. We had a great time. Uh, we usually only have three people. We had four lots to cover. So you'll find the video. Uh, feed at our YouTube channel. That's fuzzybuttstudios.com. Until next week, everybody, puppy up. Talk soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. All right, stick around, guys. <laughs>